I think it's time to start. Um, welcome to today's talk at the online <coughs> seminar on computability theory and its applications. Um, today we have uh, Lou Liu from um, Central South University talking about the coding power of products of partitions. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation uh, and to join this wonderful conference. Uh, also my first experience of online conference. In today's talk, uh, I'm mainly going to address two questions. Uh, first one, given a problem P0, uh, can we encode P0 by P1? And by that, we mean uh, for every instance of P0, there is an uh, instance of I1 of P1, such that every uh, solution to P1 instance computes a solution to the P0 instance, also known as the P0 SOC reducible to P1, stronger, strongly omniscient reducibility. Uh, another question is, if a P1 instance I1 encode a P0 instance I0, uh, what can we say about the, about the encoding? Uh, in many cases, all the known encodings are very regular. Can we verify this intuition? <clears throat> uh, first, let me explain my terminology with some, with some examples. Let's consider the classical Ramsey theorem. Uh, instance of uh, RTNK is a K coloring of n tuples of integers. A solution to the, uh, a solution to the instance is an infinite set G such that G is monochromatic for the instance coloring C. <clears throat> so the classical Ramsey theorem in, in, in terms of this terminology simply says that every RT and K instance will admit a solution. And uh, when the dimension n equals to one, RT one K instance is simply a K partition of the omega. And uh, obviously a K plus one color encode a K plus, encode a K coloring because K plus one coloring is also itself a K-coloring. Conversely, <coughs> uh, Ludwig Pelet showed that K-coloring of omega does not, does not encode, does not necessarily encode a K plus one coloring of omega. <coughs> On the other hand, when the dimension uh, is greater than one, the question is still open. We don't know whether uh, K plus, we can encode a RT2K instance with uh, RT, RT, RT2K we don't know whether we can encode RT2K plus one instance with uh, RT2K instance. <clears throat> let me uh, give some, let me present some uh, related literatures. Uh, firstly, we have the well-known fact that the faster growing function permits strong quantum avoidance for non hyperarithmetic Turing degree, which means that uh, every function from omega to omega admit uh, another function dominating the given function that does not compute a given non-hyperarithmetic non degree. Here we can think of the fast growing function as a problem. So an instance is a function from omega to omega and a solution is a function dominating the instance function. <coughs> Donnie Greenberg, Jokas and Milans proved that a two bounded DNR is, can be encoded by K bounded DNR but not uniformly encoded meaning there's no single algorithm transforming a K-bounded DNR to a two-bounded DNR. <clears throat> On the other hand, given an uh, increasing computable function H, uh, the H-bounded DNR cannot encode a two-bounded DNR. <clears throat> Jafarov and uh, Jokas proved that a uh, two-bounded DNR cannot be, uh, it's not strong as we say reducible to the uh, partition of, of omega. Actually, any, any two-bounded DNR who does not admit a computable solution, uh, it's, not as, it's not encoded by a uh, two partition. It's not encoded by a K partition of omega. And uh, recently, uh, Jaffro, Pate, Solomon, and uh, Westrack proved that not only does the, not only does RT one K plus one not associate reducible to RT one K, but with the help of the faster growing function does not bridges the gap. The general picture of these results are whenever uh, there is no obvious for P zero to, for P one to encode P zero, then it just can't. 
despite being interesting in their own, uh, these type of questions are closely related to reverse math and uh, uh, computability randomness theory. Uh, in reverse math, usually when a problem P1 implies a problem P0, it means that P0 can be solved by uh, invoking P1. For, for example, uh, Ramsey theorem with two colors uh, is equivalent to Ramsey theorem with k colors because we can solve a k color by invoking uh, two coloring for k times. Actually, you can do it in a log two k times where each time you reduce half of the colors. <coughs> Uh, in computable randomness theory, uh, some questions ask whether we can extract the randomness under some uh, combinatorial notion. And a combinatorial notion is often seen as a problem. For example, uh, Kajor Tyson proved that uh, every k coloring of omega admits a solution that does not compute any one random real. Uh, in this talk, uh, we are ma mainly focused on whether a uh, three coloring can be so can be encoded by a product of finitely many two colorings. So let me explain what is a product of two colorings. Uh, the instance is simply uh, are many two coloring altogether. It's a product of two, or it is a two product of two colorings. A solution is an R couple of infinite set such that each component is monochromatic to the corresponding component of the instance. The question is whether we can encode a three coloring with a product of two colorings. And in this, uh, we will show that there is a three coloring that is not encoded by any product of finitely many two colors. In other words, for, any, for every finitely two colorings, there is a solution to the product that does not compute any solution to the three coloring. <clears throat> the question uh, is also motivated the, the motivation is also uh, by another open question in a paper of Cholet, Jaffrey, Kirchfeld, and Pate. Uh, they ask whether stable Ramsey theorem for pairs with three colors is computably reducible to the product of two stable Ramsey theorem for pairs with two colors. So regardless of what this what this symbol means, uh, this is equivalent modular ratification to ask: Is there a dot two three coloring such that for every two dot two two coloring? There's a solution to the product that does not compute any solution of C. <clears throat> this is neither a strengthening or a weakening of the, of the question we just mentioned, because both the encoding object and the encoded object are restricted. But we actually have the following strengthening of theorem 1 answering the question in active. There exists a dot 2 3 coloring such that that is not encoded by any product of two colorings, not just the product of dot 2 2 colorings. <clears throat> Uh, the talk is uh, split into uh, four parts. First, uh, we show a general framework uh, which appeals to many encoding questions. In particular, the framework reduced the theorem to, to a lemma, which asserts that a certain Python class of colorings, there always exist two members of that class violating a certain combinatorial constraint. <clears throat> and a similar lemma shows that if a two coloring C hat uniformly encode another two coloring, then it must be the case that uh, C hat copies on some infinite domain, computable domain. And then we go back to the then we go back to the cross constraint to see uh, how complex does the how complex does the class has to be so as to maintain the cross constraint. By that we mean the two members violating the combinatorial constraint does not exist. And then when the two members exist, <clears throat> how weak can the two members be? Can they be low? Can they avoid computing a, a given degree? And then Weakening the two members in certain ways will address the theorem four we just mentioned. <clears throat> and uh, it turns out that such weakening of the weakness is a type of basis theorem, uh, just like just like a basis theorem, uh, low basis theorem for pattern class, but with the additional cross constraint. And uh, we introduced several such variants of this type of basis theorem, and among them, some are, some are open. <clears throat> Okay, uh, first part. The general framework to separate a problem from another uh, is the following. So now let's see be a three coloring, which is hyperimmune. Uh, simply think of C being very complex. It cannot be even approximated by any arithmetic degree. 
Uh, more specifically, it diagonalizes against all the arithmetic bits of description uh, whenever it is combinatorially possible to do so. And uh, also fix the uh, R many two colors. And uh, we want to construct a solution to the product so that it does not compute any solution to the three colors. <clears throat> a general approach to this type of question is to construct the sequence conditions, uh, each forcing to construct a sequence of conditions uh, where each condition is essentially a closed set of the candidates of the weak solution we construct. And each requirement will be forced by some condition. By force, we simply mean that every member in that condition uh, satisfies that requirement. <clears throat> so in the end, the, the weak solution is simply the common element of all these conditions, which must exist by compactness argument. So in this approach, the key point is how to extend a condition to force a given requirement. Usually, this approach transforms the encoding question to a uniform encoding question. And in this particular theorem, it boils down to the following, it boils down to the uniform version of exactly the original question. That is, it suffices to prove that <coughs> it suffices to prove that the three the complex three column C cannot be uniformly encoded by any product. More specifically, for any tuple of Turing functionals, there is a solution of the given product that does not such that the corresponding Turing functional using that solution does not produce a solution of the complex recurring in the specified color. <clears throat> instead of wondering whether the instead of wondering uh, whether the given complex recurring can be encoded by the product uniformly. We observe the we observe these string functionals by wondering which three current is encoded by these string functionals by some product. <clears throat> More specifically, we consider a collection Q of such pairs, where the first component is a three coloring, and the and the first component Z tilde is uniformly encoded by the second component, just like just as in just as described in the lemma five, meaning every uh, solution to the Z hat. Uh, some Turing functional in Poseidon K will produce a solution to the CQ <clears throat> And it is clear that this collection is a Pyron class. Because, as we said, uh, if C, the complex recurrent C is encoded by uh, the product, so we have the C is in the projection of Q on its first component. And because C is very complex, then the, this projection must contain a lot of sets, contains a lot of members. Uh, because when a Pyron class contains a complex member, it must contain a lot of, lot of elements. For example, when a Pyron class contains an incomputable element, then the class cannot be a singleton. And in this case, we have that projection contains some token set. The key point in this argument is that taking advantage of this fact, uh, we will show that there are two members in the queue such that <clears throat> their first component are almost destroyed as three colorings, and that the second component as a product of two colorings are not almost destroyed. By almost by almost Detroit, we mean the two currents have finite intersection on each of its colors. So suppose the two members exist, then we simply pick a solution G that is in some color, in a common color of both the C hat. Now we can see that the corresponding Turing functional does not produce a solution because the, the corresponding Turing functional is a subset of in color J, in a specified color of both C tilde. Therefore, it must be a finite set because the C tilde are almost destroyed. So uh, in summary, what we need in, in lemma five is the following. Let Q be a pylon class in the product space with full projection on three to omega. Then we have that there exist two members of Q such that their first component are almost destroyed and the second component are not. <coughs> So what we do just now is uh, reducing the uniform encoding of RT13 is impossible with via RT, via product of RT12 uh, to some lemma asserting such cost constraint cannot be satisfied. And using a similar lemma, we can study the regularity of uniform RT12 encoding. <coughs> so the question is, given a, given a two-coloring C tutor, suppose some other two-coloring C 
they had. They had uniformly encoded the Cuda, meaning uh, every solution of the hat computes via a given set of string function of a solution of the Cuda. What can we say about the Cuda and the hat? The only known way for the Cuda to be uniformly encoded is by copying is by copying the Cuda on an infinite domain. We say C hat computably copies the Cuda if there are computable functions <coughs> f and g, so that C hat of C hat of n is determined by C tilde of f of n and g of n. And we say C hat computably homogeneously copies C tilde if in addition g is the constant. The most trivial example of computably homogeneously copies is, for example, uh, a coloring itself computably homogeneous copies itself. The complement of a coloring computably homogeneous copies itself. We verify the intuition for most of CQDA. So let CQDA be a hyperimmune and uh, does not admit bubble two solution. Then the following are equivalent. There is a single Turing functional tr transforming every solution to, of CQDA to transforming every solution of C hat to a solution of CQDA. The second is C, uh, C hat computably homogeneous co copies C tilde. Uh, these are equivalent. <coughs> And uh, moreover, if the encoding is not via is not via a single Turing function, but a multiply many Turing functionals, then C hat computably copies C tilde, but not necessarily homogeneously copies copies C tilde. Uh, what about non-uniform encoding? The, the situation is very unclear, but uh, we yet we still have the following uh, sort of complex complicated situation. Uh, let C tilde be hyperimmune relative to any o, big O jam. Uh, this big O denotes the Queen's O. And suppose every solution of C hat computes a solution of C tilde, but not necessarily uniform compute. Then for some M, some omega M computable infinite set C, C hat restricted on C, uh, O jamply computably copies C tilde. <coughs> So just like the uniform encoding of RT135 product is reduced to prove the cross contrariant cannot be satisfied by a certain closed set, the above theorem boils down to the following lemma and says that if a certain closed set in the product space satisfies a stronger version of the cross constraint, then it is satisfied in a regular way. Let P uh, for a code, for a collection P, we say for a collection of coloring, we say P is almost disjoint if the intersection of P members are finite in each of their colors. And uh, let Q in the product space be a closed set having full projection on its first component. And uh, suppose Q preserves almost disjoint in the sense that for every sub collection of Q, the projection of P on its second component is almost disjoint whenever its projection on the first component is so. Then we have the uh, then we have the following. <clears throat> on some open set O, for most members in Q intersect with O, the Y component will copy X on an infinite domain. And by that we mean, as we defined before, uh, there is a collection, there's a collection Q so that every uh, member in Q, uh, there's a collection Q hat uh, with Q hat intersect with O, a subset of Q intersect with O and with the uh, exception being meager, so that the Q hat is defined as x, y in Q if and only if y copies x with this by f and g, function f and g. <clears throat> Actually, the regularity of uh, almost destroying preserving collection uh, implies a regularity of almost destroying preserving function as following that gamma be a function mapping of be a continuous function mapping a two coloring to a two coloring. And suppose it preserves almost disjoint in the sense that for every subset of its domain, its image is almost disjoint whenever P is. <clears throat> then there is a coupon set such that on this coupon set, gamma of X will, co will copy X on some infinite domain witnessed by F and G. And uh, this, this, 
this query is actually uh, can be seen as an infinite version of a simple observation. Uh, given a function from two to the n to two, and I suppose it preserves almost the joint, then we have that gamma of sigma is determined by a single bit of sigma. And uh, this disjoint preserving uh, collection or functions, they uh, sort of resemble some, they sort of resembles the automorphism of the Boolean algebra, P of the Boolean algebra of two to the omega of modular the FIN ideal. Uh, and, and I think uh, there are many literatures on this subject. Uh, we can see, for example, the following two references. Uh, unfortunately, in the above theorem, we don't know whether the conclusion follows without the unnatural uh, assumption that C tilde is hyperimmune and C tilde does not admit a Dr. 2 solution. In other words, if we simply assume that C tilde does not admit a computable solution and let C hat be a two coloring, which uniformly encodes C tilde or encoding C tilde, uh, do we still have, uh, what can we say about these two currents? Do we still have that C hat computably copies C tilde on some uh, on some domain uh, that we don't know. And uh, on the other hand, neither do, we, uh, neither do I know any other non-trivial ways uh, other than completely copy a two coloring uh, so as to encode a two coloring. And, then, <clears throat> and uh, now let's get back to the cross constraint. Uh, we wonder how complex does Q has to be so as to satisfy the cross constraint. By that we mean <clears throat> Uh, by that we mean um, that Q be a subset in the product space uh, having full projection on its first component. How complex does Q has to be so that for every mem two members of Q, whenever the first component are almost destroyed, then so is the second component. <coughs> when, when the dimension R equals to one, uh, this, R, this dimension R uh, is the dimension here. The Q is in a product space where the second component, the second component is a product of two colorings. So when the dimension is one, then we know that Q does not exist. And the reason is finitism, because <coughs> there are three mutually destroying the three colorings, but for every three many two colorings, two of them are not almost destroying. For the general case, uh, when R is greater than one, even if we let two parties play this in a game, the party who maintaining the constraint has a winning strategy. Uh, that is, at each round, Alice presents a three coloring and then Bob presents a two, present the product. And Bob will try to maintain the constraint that whenever the three coloring, whenever two three colorings presented by Alice are almost destroyed, the corresponding products he presented are almost destroyed. It turns out that uh, uh, Bob has a winning strategy. But does Bob has a winning strategy without uh, looking at the history of this game? It turns out that if such strategy uh, exists, it cannot be sigma one one definable. More specifically, uh, if the collection Q, as we mentioned before, is sigma one one, then Q does not satisfy the cross constraint. On the other hand, uh, join us, sure, uh, sure, sure. Point out that a non-principal ultra filter on omega uh, gives rise to such a set Q. So that is, uh, if there is a non-principal ultra filter on omega, then there is a function uh, such that which preserves a uh, two element wise almost destroyed. So actually the function can be three valued, uh, gamma x equals to one of the products so that uh, depending on which color of x is in the ultra filter. And uh, moreover, uh, Joanna showed that the assertion there is a Projective set Q with satisfying the cross constraint is consistent with CFC. This is because uh, in the model of Godel's L, there exists a there exists a, a sigma one two non-principal ultra filter on the omega. So based on this fact, we can construct a we can construct this Q uh, in a product space 
straight to the omega to uh, with two to the omega to three. <coughs> And uh, in the above construction, uh, we can see that the more dimension you allow, the more likely such Q exists. For example, we have argued that when dimension equals to one, such Q does not exist. So let ECCR denote assertion that there's a set Q in the product space with R dimension uh, satisfying the cross constraint. We wonder whether the implication uh, ECCR implies ECCR plus one is strict in the set zero sense. And also let EU denote the assertion that there exists an ultra, a non-principal ultra filter on omega. But we wonder whether uh, the, the existence of such collection Q implies, conversely, the existence of non-principal ultra filter. And uh, just like the uh, encoding question of RD1, RD13 with a product of RD12 is reduced to the, to such a, to, to the demo that such cross constraint cannot be satisfied by a one class. The improvement of the improvement of theorem two is reduced to the following lemma, <clears throat> which asserts that for such a one class having full projection and having full projection, uh, there will be two members in Q, such as not only do they satisfy the do they satisfy the combinatorial constraint, but the two members are weakened in certain ways. By that we mean that, given a three current which is some sort of hyperimmune, we have C is still hyperimmune relative to the two members. And uh, it is clear that uh, this lemma. This lemma 18 uh, is a type of basis theorem uh, with the additional cross constraint. The corresponding uh, normal version of this basis theorem simply says that the uh, pylon class preserves, preserves hyperimmune, meaning that uh, for every non empty pylon class, every hyperimmune function, there's a member in the pylon class so that the function is still hyperimmune relative to the member. And also, uh, previously, the lemma five. Previously, the lemma six uh, is also a, a basic theorem uh, because the normal version simply says that a uh, non empty pylon class admit a member which is uh, top two. Uh, in general, uh, every basis theorem can be asked whether the, cr the cross constraint version of that basis theorem is true. Uh, for example, uh, the quantum avoidance and the low basis theorem. We have that the, the, cr the cross constraint version of quantum avoidance and the low basis theorem is true, uh, which means for such collection Q having full protection on its first component, uh, there are two members in the Q so that satisfying the combinatorial constraint and uh, meanwhile, the two members together are low and it does not compute a given Turing degree. On the other hand, if we look at uh, general constraint, then it is possible that the constrained version of some basis theorem is no longer true. For example, we have the simple uh, result that saying there is a non empty pylon class Q such that for every two members of Q, if they are not almost equal, then they together will compute compute the, the jump, uh, simply because there is a non-empty pylon class so that for every member of Q, if X as a set is infinite, then X compute the jump. Uh, 
Uh, during our proof of the uh, constrained version basis theorem, we try some approach uh, which does not succeed. Uh, but this approach gener generates some interesting question, and one of them is the following. Uh, if we replace the, we know that if two colorings are almost disjoint, then they mutually compute each other. So if we, <clears throat> if we replace a combinatorial constraint, if we replace almost disjoint, by mutually incomputable, then we ob obtain a sort of the following question. Given two Turing degree, D0 and D1, that is D0 does not compute D1, and given a non empty pylon class Q, just a non empty pylon class, no other restriction, does there exist a member in Q so that X does not compute D0 and uh, X plus D0 does not compute D1? The difficulty of this question lies that when we force some facts about the D0 plus X, usually we would use the forcing condition, which is a non empty Pyloran class in D0. But there's no guarantee that a Pyloran class in D0 admit a member that does not compute D0. Okay, uh, now, uh, We uh, will introduce some questions about uh, uh, about infinite product. What we just uh, what we just uh, mentioned is a finite product. But what about infinite product of RD12? First, we know that RD12 infinite product is capable of encoding fast growing function. Therefore, it encodes any hyper arithmetic Turing degree. On the other hand, uh, using a result of Solovey, which says that there's an infinite set, so that every Subset does not compute a uh, given does not compute uh, given non hyperarithmetic here it is a, a non hyperarithmetic degree. Therefore, we have that uh, the problem RT12 infinite product admit a uh, strong convoidence for non hyperarithmetic Turing degree. But on the other hand, uh, the above uh, approach to finite product does not obviously generalized to a uh, product of infinitely many two currents. We don't know if there is a three currency not encoded that cannot be encoded by any product of infinitely many, <coughs> infinitely many two currents. Uh, that is whether there is a three current so that for every sequence of two currents, uh, there's a solution to the infinite product that doesn't compute a, a solution of the uh, solution of C, uh, okay. Was very fast, and uh, that's all about my talk. And thank you for attention. Uh, uh, thank you for attention. And thank you all the again for attending. Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> I will now ask um, if there are any questions. Um, um, I think there's sufficiently few of us that we can just uh, turn on our microphones and ask. Alternatively, we can uh, use the various uh, Zoom gadgets of raising hands. Um, there are no other questions. First of all, I would like to, uh, what I think is correct to record, uh, if you can go to the second slide, please. Um, somewhere there was a reference to work of, of mine with uh, Carl and Rod and uh, Kevin Mylands. Right. Uh, in, if I understand the definition correctly, I think this is a much older theorem of Carl's that uh, DNRK, DNRK functions compute DNR2 functions, but not uniformly. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, I should I will check this more carefully. Okay. Um, again, a general question. 
Um, these questions about encoding, do they have reverse mathematical implications? Uh, yes, in some cases, yes. Uh, because, for example, uh, the result that RT22 does not imply the ACA uh, is closely related to the uh, strong convoyance of, of RT12. Uh, 